Thank you, Stephen. I will now uh, share my slides. Or maybe I won't. Um, we can see it. <laughs> can you see my slide or just the Zoom slide? We can see your slide introduction, HIV violence and mental health. Oh, wonderful. Okay, thank you. Okay, good day, everyone. I'm very excited to be here. Um, <clears throat> I'm so glad you could all join. Um, I would like to share an overview of the HIV violence and mental health and outline uh, interventions to address. Um, why these are critical for epidemic control. Okay, let me just see. Sorry about this technical issue. Okay, can you see the next slide with the map? Can everyone see the map slide? Yes, we can. Okay, wonderful, thank you. Not sure why my page down is not working, but we'll make it through. Okay, so. Let's start. Uh, WHO estimates that approximately 35% of women worldwide, that is one in three, have experienced either physical and or sexual intimate partner violence or non-partner sexual violence in their lifetime. The health impact of violence affects both males and females. Women who are exposed to intimate partner violence are twice as likely to experience depression and almost twice as likely to have alcohol disorders they are 16% more times likely to have a baby with low birth weight, 16% more likely to have a baby with low birth weight, and 1.5 more times likely to acquire HIV, as well as contract syphilis, chlamydia, and gonorrhea. For males, data from the Violence Against Children survey show that two-thirds of boys who experience sexual violence report mental health distress later in life. The link between violence and HIV can be direct and indirect. Survivors may contract HIV directly through experiences of forced sex. They may be at an increased risk of HIV through exposure to, S to other STIs contracted at the time of sexual abuse. <clears throat> we must also consider how violence can indirectly lead to HIV infection. Violence or the perceived threat of violence may lead to early sexual debut, compromised condom negotiation, multiple partners, delays in HIV testing, and reduced access to sexual and reproductive health services. Violence can lead to homelessness and orphanhood, which can contribute to transactional sex or survival sex, which is often higher risk sex. Violence can contribute to barriers to reaching 95, 95, 95. This slide shows the impact of violence across the HIV clinical cascade. For HIV prevention, violence or the fear of violence from an intimate partner can prevent someone from seeking and initiating pre-exposure prophylaxis or, or PrEP. It can also prevent or delay a survivor from accessing post-exposure prophylaxis or PEP. Violence can be a barrier to accessing testing and disclosing their status. Violence is also associated with reduced linkage to HIV care, initiation on ART, and reduce adherence to ART. <clears throat> Persons with pre-existing mental disorders, including depression, are at increased risk of HIV infection, often as a result of unsafe sexual behavior or coercive sex. They are also less likely to seek information and health services. A systematic review in the journal AIDS estimated that 24% of people living with HIV in Sub-Saharan Africa suffer from depression. Mental health conditions can also have an impact on access to treatment and adherence. Treatment for depression can improve adherence. And one study showed the odds of adhering to care was 83% higher for participants who receive mental health services. Access to quality mental health care is imperative to reach the second and third 90s. In addition, being HIV positive can be a risk factor for exposure to violence and may also increase vulnerability and exposure to multiple forms of abuse. Disclosure may trigger violence and lead to increased stigma by a partner or family member, as well as internalized stigma. And living with HIV may increase risk for developing mental health conditions. 
A syndemic is defined as two or more afflictions interacting synergistically and contributing to excess burden of disease in a population. Syndemics include epidemics, both of diseases and the social conditions that contribute to the spread of disease. In the HIV violence and mental health syndemic, these diseases reinforce one another and are inextricably bound to one another. Key populations, including adolescent girls and young women, are disproportionately affected by this syndemic. In order to successfully decrease one epidemic, such as HIV, there needs to be a decrease in the epidemics of mental health disease and violence. The PEPFAR, COP guidance, supports targeting HIV, the HIV violence and mental health syndemic. The top two boxes outline guidance for mental health services to be integrated in, into HIV programs across the cascade and for service providers to be trained to screen and provide low intensity psychological interventions. The bottom two boxes highlight the guidance to provide interventions to help improve the mental health and psychosocial functioning of GBD survivors and capacitate both providers and implementing partners on counseling and psychosocial support. Today, we will hear more about how the evidence-based intervention CETA could be integrated into PEPFAR DREAMS, Orphans and Vulnerable Children, and Care and Treatment Programming to help improve the mental health and psychosocial functioning of survivors of violence, as well as people living with HIV. We will also discuss how CETA can help PEPFAR support mental health services despite the global shortage of mental health workers. Dr. Laura Murray will now provide an overview of CETA. I'm turning it over to you, Laura. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Jennifer. Um, so we thought um, as a start, I see more and more people sort of popping on, um, that I would click on my video just for a minute, and I hope it doesn't force us to lose any of you on the connection. Um, just so you can see who you're speaking to. Um, so as I don't know if everyone's able to see me. Um, my name is Laura Murray um, and I work at Johns Hopkins and I'm just really honored that all of you decided to join us um, today or this afternoon or evening. And I think our hope for today is that this webinar is very interactive. And so, um, as Stephen mentioned, um, there's a chat box, there's a Q&A box, and um, I, I think Stephen, Jennifer, and I all really feel that we want you to engage in that. So even as I am speaking, if a question comes up, uh, please enter it in. That will allow us to make sure we answer all of your questions. Um, and perhaps even allow me to make sure that I address questions you may have as I go through the slides. Um, and uh, don't hesitate to, to ask questions. We really want this to be a useful webinar. And um, as webinars are sort of challenging to not multitask, we hope a lot of you will um, be able to be engaged uh, through this. So I'm going to now go ahead and share my screen. And is everyone able to see that? Yes, we can, Laura. Okay, yes, great. Fantastic. Okay, so um, I'm going to be talking about the common elements treatment approach, as um, others have said. And we're very excited to talk about this and the work we've done and also learn from you what questions you might have. Um, about the approach and how you could integrate it. It looks like my arrow isn't working. There we go. Okay. Um, so I always want to make sure we give a lot of credit. We have a wide number of funders, USAID, um, DFID, the um, South African MRC, and we have worked with so many partners. A lot of our partners have been ministries of health. Um, many of many clinics that we know HIV work is going um, on in. We also have a number of faith-based partners 
um, for example, Catholic Relief Services, World Vision, and also a number of other more community-based organizations um, and faith-based organizations. So I wanted to talk a little bit about why a CETA type program for HIV. Um, and so there's many, many benefits of integrating mental health. And this is just a, a global sort of quick view of a lot of literature out there, um, perhaps things that you could cite at the bottom there that talk about how integral mental health care is and really allowing reduced HIV risk behavior, improved adherence, better linkage and retention, and then ultimately, of course, reaching that goal of redu reduced viral load. Um, so this is also important as far as medical studies showing that mental health care can actually improve HIV treatment adherence. And I circle these two because this is really where we see most of CETA's work is patient related factors. So you see perception, knowledge, fear, substance use, but then also the facility related factors, um, the delivery of disclosures and information, the counseling services and et cetera. And we'll talk more about that as we go through. Okay, this is sort of my last theory slide, but I wanted to give you all some information that you might be able to um, put in your uh, proposals. So this is what's called a health belief model about adherence. And I just want you to pay attention to, um, there's individual factors, so a lot of things that Jennifer raised, mental health, substance use, et cetera. And then if you look around this model, there's a lot of perceptions, perceptions of disease progression, percep perception of adherence, um, perception of barriers and benefits to ART. And then there's a lot about behavior, likely to engage in behavior and, and self-efficacy. So what does CETA actually work on, which I hope I'll show you through this presentation. It actually works on perceptions, lifestyle, of course, those individual factors like mental health and substance use, um, problem solving barriers to getting ARTs, um, taking them, things like that, behavior change and risky behaviors. So some of the very models that lead to and predict adherence versus non-adherence patterns talk about the very things that CETA works on. Okay. So let's take sort of a, a very global view of mental health. <laughs> and I, I put this up here, I just wanna make sure when I say mental health throughout the treatment, you understand that it's related to those things at the bottom. So we're talking about very common problems like depression. Um, you probably all know individuals that have been raped or have experienced other traumatic um, experiences substance use, violence, poor relationships. So a few things about uh, the global mental health world, and this is again, just a tidbit, we will send out slides of the evidence that we've been accumulating over the past uh, decade or so, just really showing that there are treatments that work for depression, trauma, anxiety, substance use in low and middle income countries. So a number of very rigorous randomized trials. Um, just to note that all of these studies utilize non-professionals. So we are talking about um, lay providers, just like Jennifer um, mentioned. So this is a closer look at one of those trials that I just highlighted. And this trial was actually in Zambia, working with lay providers to deliver trauma-focused cognitive behavioral therapy. Now, I would love to hear on the Q&A how many of you are familiar with cognitive behavioral therapy. It can be a mouthful. And we're gonna talk a little bit about what that actually is. Um, but you see here on the graph that Cognitive behavioral therapy was very effective in reducing trauma, and that was compared to what people were getting just treatment as usual, which is often sort of your basic psychosocial programs like 
maybe soccer games, maybe a one-off sort of advice giving session, et cetera. Okay, so great progress. We've got a lot of research showing that programs are feasible, adaptable, and very effective that you can support with very high-end journal articles that can show um, folks that they're, that they're effective. However, what we see is there is actually little to no uptake of these interventions. And so what we talk about is an implementation gap where we have information, but for some reason it's not working or not being used in systems on the ground. Okay, so let's start talking about the common elements treatment approach. Um, and again, I just wanna remind you guys as we go through, um, add those Q and A's, let us know what you're thinking and what you're um, just even mulling through your head as, as we go through. So we're gonna talk a little bit about the rationale, sort of why would CETA be something that you're interested in, um, an overview of what it is, and then the evidence base and sort of why would you invest in, in a CETA type program. Okay, so the norm with most individuals is something we call comorbidity. And I hope a lot of you are, are sitting wherever you are nodding in that um, most individuals come in with multiple overlap of problems. So say for example, we have a um, 15 year old female that comes into us and um, is HIV positive, is not adhering great to ARTs. And she's also been sexually abused and she's got a lot of depression just about life. So what you see here is a lot of these um, problems overlapping and that's really the norm. That's not the exception. And one of the things we really looked at is all of those studies that we did um, over the past decade use something we call focal treatments. So I don't know if you can see my little cursor, but these are all just different manuals, right? So behavioral activation is a very focal treatment, um, usually used for depression, cognitive processing therapy and TFCBT focus, and were developed primarily for trauma. And so what do we see? Well, someone comes into us like this young girl and we think, oh goodness, I have to do a trauma-based program and now I have to integrate a depression-based program. And pretty soon your HIV programs are going to look like this poor woman where you're gonna have manuals and binders sitting on your shelves and we're just all overwhelmed. And so not only the task of trying to integrate all these programs, uh, but also trying to make sure um, we learn them, we keep them, and then of course the cost is very prohibitive. So what is CETA? Uh, this is a slide full of sort of technical terms, but I did want to make sure you at least saw them. So technically, it's a transdiagnostic modular multi-problem flexible approach. Now, I know that's just crazy to have all in one sentence. Um, I hope some of you got a laugh about that this morning. All it really means is that we're using one approach to treat multiple problems. So instead of you having all those binders and, and integrating you know, six different manuals or programs into your HIV work, you can use one. And I think one of the things that's really important uh, is that it's not a new treatment. It's really just an approach. It's made up of the same ingredients that have been tested over the past decade. It's a difference in approach of how we teach it. So what we have here, this little wheel, is just a look at the different elements. So what you see is some education, um, thinking in a different way. You see the behavioral activation element, which is just enjoying sort of more pleasurable activities, talking about trauma memories. You see the substance use and the problem solving. So these are the elements. And you can sort of pull out pieces of the pie as you would like. 
So again, going back to our adolescent that we're seeing that's HIV positive, not very adherent, um, has been raped and has depression, we might choose certain elements. So for example, maybe she's not coming in with substance use. So we wouldn't use the alcohol abuse intervention. We would take that out because she's not presenting with a need for that. So this is an example of thinking in a different way that we do. So we highlight a situation, in this case, for example, going to the clinic and people were staring at this girl. And we talk about triangles, really where we just emphasize, what are you thinking? How does that relate to how you're feeling? And then how does that relate to your action or your behavior? So her thought is, they know I'm sick. They're gonna look down on me. And she was feeling bad and sad. So this was 10 out of 10 rating. So that means 10 is one of her strongest emotions. And what was her behavioral action? I'm looking at that left triangle now. She went home and she didn't pick up our ARVs. How many of you have experienced something like that? I know you guys are all nicely muted, but I wish I could have a show of hands because I, I imagine a lot of you would have a, a situation like that. So what we work on is let's now move to a different triangle. So that right hand triangle. And we try to encourage people to look at the same situation in a different way. And so the situation hasn't changed. She still went to the clinic and people were staring at her. Her new thought is people go to the clinic for a lot of reasons and they don't know me. She still feel, felt bad if you see that, but her bad feeling is a three out of 10. So it's not that we're getting rid of feelings, it's that we're having them at a level that they're easier to manage. And here in this case, she felt better. And what was her behavior? she actually went to the clinic. So what we see is by changing our thoughts, even in the same exact situation, it can really affect our behavior. Here's another example. This was actually a 22 year old male who was HIV positive. And this gentleman was having unprotected sex with multiple partners. And again, just raise your hands. If you guys have experienced that, I, again, I think it's probably a very all, you know, common situation for us. So his initial thought is, why should I use common condoms? I'm already HIV positive. And again, I'd love to hear in the Q&A how many of you have heard some comment like that. And just a lot of anger, frustration, and sadness. And again, you see those 10 out of 10s, meaning their emotions are at the top of their level. And then what was his actions? Well, he drank a lot, he would get drunk, and he'd have unprotected sex with a large number of partners. So what we also begin to understand is sort of what's going through these folks' minds and what are their emotions that's guiding their behavior that we're wanting to change. So this was his revised triangle, and we don't do this for them. We don't give them the thoughts. They come up with these on their own. So he decided his new thought would be, I should stick to one sexual partner to avoid reinfection and I can get free condoms from the clinic. Now, you see at the feelings, he's still angry and sad, but at a lower level. And what does he do? He goes and gets free condoms. So um, a behavior change based on a thought change. This is just another element. I'm trying to give you sort of a feel for CETA. It's not, I think it looks, it can look complicated. This is an example of a story, of a trauma story that we worked through. So, so this was a boy who really was not into good things, a lot of non-adherence, a lot of substance use. And the story he had to write about to get to a better place was about the day he was told. Again, I imagine a lot of you have run into this where this was a boy uh, taking supplements, as he was told, for almost his whole life. And finally, one day his mom and aunt let him know that he was positive and that these were ARVs and he was very angry. And so writing this out and talking about it and reprocessing some of those thoughts really changed his actions and his behaviors and increased his adherence. Again, just a quick look at what we might do for substance use. We look at why they're using alcohol use so here you see entertainment, frustration, stress, 
and then we come up with different things that they can do, for example, replacing with other activities. Okay, what is the evidence for CETA? And so I see a question, so I'm just gonna go back for a second. Can you explain the significance of using the triangle? Um, there is nothing real significant with that shape. So it tends to be an easy shape for people to understand. You could also use a circle. Sometimes we do this just in columns. For example, with adults, we sometimes do the same activity but it's in, in columns. So no necessary um, significance. Love the questions. Keep those coming. I hope I'm keeping you all engaged and not multitasking too much. Okay, so um, what is the evidence for CETA? Let's talk about why, we, why would you invest in this? We really wanna make sure that people get the best treatment, not just something that sounds good, but that we actually know works. So there is quite a bit of data on CETA, which I'm gonna go through. This is just an overview chart of multiple trials that have completed, and then there's multiple trials that are sort of in press. So you see on the right-hand side, what we call effect sizes which means that they're um, usually in mental health, an effect size of 0.6 or higher is very, very strong, meaning that it was very effective. So you see high effect sizes, and I'll show you some graphs to be more clear. So this is the study done in Iraq with survivors of torture and trauma. They all had a multitude of problems. So depression, trauma, many of them were HIV, many of them were sort of sick. Um, and CETA worked very effectively compared to a waitlist control. So this graph is based on a number of studies that we actually did in Iraq, showing that CETA outperformed treatments that focus on only one area or one primary area. I'm just gonna say that again, because I know it's, so you see the blue line is CETA. And what we saw is that although treatments like behavioral activation for depression or cognitive processing therapy for trauma are effective, CETA outperformed them. So what we're seeing is this type of flexible approach really can address the gamut of challenges. Okay, and so here is a study we did in Thailand on the Thailand-Myanmar border. Again, showing that CETA was highly effective for sort of the big areas of depression, trauma, and anxiety compared to treatment as usual. And again, these are very, very high effect sizes. So for youth, we did a number of studies with, um, this was actually in Ethiopia with Somali refugee children on, on the border. Um, HIV was actually very, was thought to be very high in this area, but sadly there was limited testing. As you can imagine, the population was very transient. There was sort of programs that would pop up and then disappear. We used CETA for youth. Um, now in this trial, we did not have a control group. Um, so we see the drop in symptoms here for trauma and then for what we call internalizing, which in kids is sort of kids and youth and teenagers, sort of everything like uh, sadness, depression, anxiety, and then externalizing, which is your sort of behavior problems, your risky behaviors, your aggression. So we saw a very nice drop in all of these. Okay, so right now, sort of a, a take home from that is CETA is really the only modular, flexible, multi-problem approach that has multiple rigorous trials in lower resource settings using lay providers. One last study we just wanted to highlight is a more recent study of CETA in Zambia that specifically looked at the impact of violence and alcohol misuse. And if you remember, Jennifer really talked about the connection between violence, uh, substance use, and 
HIV, sort of lack of engagement in care and treatment, um, trouble with adherence, et cetera. So these are two areas that are very closely linked to HIV risk and, and poor adherence, the violence and alcohol misuse. So the trial protocol paper for this is out. Um, the data I'm about to present is hot off the press. It's currently under review. So everyone on the phone, you guys are sort of some of the first to hear it. Um, so, uh, but the protocol paper is out there. So I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on that. Our interventions were CETA and then we had a treatment as usual, but we did weekly calls to them for safety. Our delivery was both group format and individual. So this may be a question you all have, can CETA be uh, delivered in group or individual? Yes, it can be delivered in both ways. Who did we treat? In this case, we actually um, treated men, women, and youth. So it wasn't just one population. We really tried to look at the family system. So I'm gonna talk a little bit, I wanna make sure that we have plenty of time for discussion. Here's just a look at what the population looked like. So note that the prevalence of reported HIV positive, um, and then very, very high comorbidity across everything that we've been talking about, hazardous alcohol use, depression, trauma, um, and then other substances. So again, we found the same overlap of problems and that comorbidity that other researchers have talked about. This is the baseline for youth. So lots of violence and mental health. You see very high reported rates of physical abuse, emotional abuse, sexual abuse, and trauma. Um, note that we didn't have terribly high rates of HIV positive kids, which is a little bit striking in Zambia, given our other studies there. We went back and interviewed a lot of the families um, qualitatively and what we found is that actually a large number of our over 100 kids actually were never tested. So that's, that's of concern too. So this is a look at the violence within our population. And again, keep in mind that this is a um, population that has a lot of HIV positive families, a lot of substance use, a lot of violence, sort of that whole um, constellation that Jennifer talked about. Here what we see is the, some of the highest is forced sex, which is obviously of concern with HIV. Um, and then of course a lot of slapping, hitting, um, threatening with a weapon, etc. And you see the pink is report by women and the purple is reported by men. So this is a look at substance use in our population. And I think the take home message from this is that there was a lot more drug use than I think we were expecting with our population. And here we have all in one slide, men, women, and children. So I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with a data safety and monitoring board. This is actually a board that is often used in trials and reviews data to see if there's any ethical concerns about continuing the trial. And so um, we had a, a monitoring board that evaluated our program and they decided that we actually had to stop the entire study a year early. And so you're probably used to hearing that with medication. Um, this is highly rare for psychosocial programs. And so that really sent a very strong message um, to the area of violence and, and HIV and substance use that this was so effective for such a high risk population that they felt it was unethical to keep withholding it. So we had to offer it to controls early. Um, so I'm going to just answer a couple questions because I really want to make sure that you guys are using that Q&A. 
Um, so is CETA specifically for HIV positive adolescents? No. So as you see in all of our populations, we have some that are HIV positive, we have some that are not tested, we have some that are HIV negative. What we also see is that a lot of folks that are in our studies HIV negative, what we hear from them is we can prevent HIV, we set them on a trajectory where they change a lot of their risky behavior. Um, so, so it can be used for anything. We've also certainly worked globally with populations that aren't as HIV affected, so that's, that's very um, open. So um, there's a very interesting question from uh, Viva on the high hazardous alcohol use among female participants. Um, so actually, we did find that females were using a lot of alcohol. Um, and I think you're talking about this one here. Um, so in other words, we have these two hazardous alcohol use on yourself and then hazardous alcohol use by the partner. So women, 93% of women reported that their husband was using alcohol which keep in mind that we were recruiting people specifically for the study that used alcohol, so, so that's right. But 44% of women actually reported that they too used alcohol. And what was interesting is with CETA, remember that wheel, for the women that came in that did have alcohol use, we just inserted that element and we worked with them on that also. Um, okay. How long between the first and second triangle and then follow up? We teach them those triangles all in one session. So we start with very everyday situations like you got caught in the rain, you stepped in a pile of mud, um, things like that. And then we move to sort of more and more stressful situations. And then if there's trauma, we can move through those to later in sessions. So at the end of about um, eight sessions, they've worked through most of their triangles. The Zambia study was urban. Very, very good question. So this study I'm talking about now, and it looks like, there we go. Can you see that all still? Jennifer or Steven, are you still able to see my screen? Hi, Laura, yes, yes we can. Okay, great, great. Just wanted to make sure. So um, the Zambia study was urban, it was in uh, Lusaka. And we have found in, we've been in Lusaka for quite some time, very, very high rates of sexual abuse um, for both males and females. Okay. I'm going to keep going because what I'm seeing is I'll, you guys are asking fantastic questions and a lot of them are about implementation, which is what we're moving towards. So for those of you on the call that are concerned about sort of making sure you understand the data, and I think when we write programs in, this is so important that we really are able to say these programs are effective. CETA very effectively reduced um, violence compared to our control condition. Um, this was a significant change, again, why the monitoring board stopped. You see the drops in both physical and sexual violence here. And the other thing that we're seeing is that even at 12 months post baseline, those stay down. And so the challenge is with some programs, for example, just checking in on a family, you often see a drop, but then as soon as you stop checking in on them, it shoots back up. And one of the beautiful things about CETA is that we're teaching them skills. So they use these skills for life. And so that's why with cognitive behavioral therapy or something like CETA, we often see long-term results. Last uh, graph for those of you that are so tired of this research. Um, <laughs> CETA significantly dropped alcohol use. 
And we're super excited about this because I think we all know that alcohol is a huge play in HIV and HIV risk and the youth getting um, infected and, and things like that. So I, I think something that really shows this is, is critical. Okay, so um, a couple case examples I just wanted to highlight so that you feel sort of the gist of these cases. We would ask men and women before treatment. You see here the men is talking about, the man is talking about, he drinks, makes him forget, then he spends money he doesn't have, he's evicted from the house. When his wife talks too much, he beats her. This is all stuff they told us like at first visit. This is what was going on. His partner's report, we fight a lot, particularly when he's drunk. He doesn't provide for the family because he spends money on beer. Um, so lots of, lots of stuff going on. Post-treatment, so after CETA, the man talks about, I used to drink, fight, even urinate on the bed. These sessions have helped me learn unhelpful, changing unhelpful thoughts to helpful. I learned not to blame my wife over drinking and be supportive. One of the things we hear a lot is I've learned to accept my um, status or my wife's status and encourage her to go get the medication instead of women having to hide it. In this particular case, the women's report now that he doesn't shout, he still drinks, but only moderately. There's a big economic change. Um, the woman doesn't shout back as much. Also, um, to be safe in the future, um, she talks to him more, so there's enhanced communication. Here you see the violence really, really drop, just the number of incidences down to, you know, session seven, eight, nine is when we're getting zero reports on violence. Here you see the alcohol use, 38, 28, and then down to zero. So really drinking a lot to very little. Okay, so just to reiterate, CETA has been shown by multiple scientific rigorous trials that it's an effective inter intervention for violence, alcohol use, and, and those mental health issues. So let's get into a lot of your questions. And I'm going to go back and answer a lot of these with these next slides, which is focused on how can CETA be integrated into HIV prevention, testing, care, and treatment. So we're all trying to get this 95, 95, 95. Okay, one of the questions, who can provide CETA? Um, so one of the things you probably all know is that most of us work in settings where there's no mental health providers, uh, mental health professionals. And so there's been an approach called task sharing or task shifting that the World Health Organization and others have really advocated, which is the use of lay providers. So I tried to list out here sort of what the options were for who can provide CETA. They, your providers don't need any advanced education. Usually we have people, we try to get people who have finished somewhere around a fourth grade equivalent. We most of the time get that. We of course want people that speak the local language. I would say this third bullet point on here is one of the most important. I imagine you see that in your work too. They need to have a passion to reach these goals and to help folks that are dealing with, with HIV and other types of um, problems like depression or trauma. We really like to have people that know communities that are sort of comfortable talking to people. Um, they can be people at all stages. So they could be a worker that's really working in prevention or testing. It doesn't matter sort of at what stage of that cycle that Jennifer showed us. They can be at any of those. You really do need to find people with time. And I think that's the biggest challenge we have found with programs that haven't been successful is, for example, let's say some of you work in a, in a clinic and you have a number of nurses that work with you. And so everyone thinks, well, let's train the nurses. The challenge with nurses is they have a lot of other skills that are needed in other areas. And so we found that although nurses are fantastic at this, they very rarely have the time to actually provide this. And so same with, you know, sort of other types of professionals get, that get pulled into, um, into other aspects. So how do we train um, these lay providers? 
So over here we have it. We have an in-person training, which is usually about eight to ten days. We have practice locally. So, so what that means is, let's say we have a group of, th of four or five people, one of them would be chosen as a supervisor and they would continue to meet with their groups locally. Then they slowly take on one client and then multiple clients. And then this whole time, they are on phone calls with a CETA trainer until the local supervisor feels confident. So this is actually called the Apprenticeship Model of Training. It's published, um, you're, you can reference it as a very evidence-based method. It's used not only by the CETA intervention, but by most interventions in, in global health. Okay, CETA training, that apprenticeship model builds capacity in a number of areas. And so um, when you take a look at this list, I think most people stop at the first bullet point that we teach those CETA elements. But what do we also teach? We teach them how to track clients using monitoring tools weekly so we can see if their substance use is up and down. We can see if their risk behavior is up and down. We also teach supervision skills. Um, how do you actually supervise a group of people? Um, we also teach safety protocols. And I'd love to throw a question to the group of how many of you actively ask suicide questions every time you come into contact with someone, because that is actually the recommendation. We want to be asking about safety, about abuse, about violence, about sort of these life and death sort of high risk things every time we come into contact with anyone, even in primary health care. And so that's something that we roll into our CETA training where your folks are able to understand how to do that. And then we work with you to set up a system so you make sure you feel safe. Um, we also talk a lot about just how do you implement. So for example, for some of you that might be interested in CETA, we certainly work with groups to talk about even before the training, who would be the best providers in the area or the program that you work in. Um, how do you recruit from the community in the best way, which I think is one of the questions coming up. Um, how do you use different forms? How do you get buy-in from stakeholders to provide? Are there space issues? So all sorts of things like that. So what does a CEDAR provider job look like? I think that's another one of the questions that has popped up. Um, so it's very flexible. So let me give you some examples. And then again, record your questions and, and Stephen and Jennifer and the whole team is are writing all these down and we can also print these off. So please don't feel like your questions are going to be wasted. We want to make sure we get to all of these. So the time a CETA provider needs is very flexible. It could be someone that works one to two days a week or all the way up to full time. So I just wanted to lay out a couple examples. We've worked with HIV peer educators, where in a lot of the places we work, these are folks that sort of do community outreach, try to find people who haven't been tested and get them in for testing, try to really normalize and things like that. And they might, to, they might do outreach, continue that outreach for two to three days a week, and then provide CEDA two days a week, maybe at the local community church or something. We've also had a lot of faith-based workers that do a lot of psychosocial counseling and they've added CETA skills. And so they roll it into their job, their sort of existing job or sort of what they're, what they're working on. Supervision is about two hours a week. We're very, very um, keen on giving supervision. Um, this is an easy work. It really enhances the treatment, helps our providers. It's just good practice. So that's something that you want to think about, that an extra two hours per week would be on that. Location, super flexible. I imagine some of you are in clinics. Some of you are just out in the community. We've done this in schools, under a tree. Wherever you really feel like the people will come. We tend not to just sit somewhere and wait for people to come to us. We really try to look about, you know, sort of where are these people in the community, where would they feel comfortable? Delivery. So I mentioned it could be group or individual. It can be one element or multiple elements. It's all based on need. Um, 
What does it look like? I will say one of the things that's pretty important is phone use. Now, I imagine most people have phones now, but this is really for those safety cases. So let's say you're out, you've just given um, a diagnosis, someone's HIV positive, you've had to tell them, and they do the safety questions. Do you think about killing yourself? Do you have a plan? And they do. So they're gonna drink rat poison and they have rat poison right behind the house. They need a phone. And so when you sort of look about look at what the provider job looks like, we do require that that's um, in place so that we can make sure we um, respond to safety concerns. Payment, again, very flexible. We have seen done all sorts of ways. Um, sometimes people create new job lines for lay workers or, for example, put it into their um, operating plan or just their regular budget that they're going to provide this. Um, lots of times what we find is people already have lines for quote unquote psychosocial programming, but they haven't been using anything that's real evidence based. And so they just keep those lines. Um, but, but now their folks have an increased skill. Um, I do think lots of times pay increases because of the additional skills. The questions have slowed down. I hope that's not because you guys are disinterested and hopefully I'm answering some of these questions that I saw. <laughs> um, okay, so, um, yeah, so Betty, I got your question. Technical capacity can be used in communities or households. Um, it can be used with, um, so Henri, it can be used with children not living with their biological um, parents. That's not a problem. Um, you've also asked about identification of young kids with violence. Um, we have found recruitment of those folks through schools, through community members, through sort of local mamas who sort of know of things. Um, so lots of different ways to do that. Okay, so Emma, you've got great sessions. We're move, great questions, sorry, Emma. And we're moving into your question here. What does the CETA provider job look like? So numbers of sessions. You could do a prevention session just in one session. So let's say, for example, you have a group of 50 people and you wanna just do those triangles. You wanna just show them that there's a different way to think about HIV or HIV testing, for example. One hour session in, in large groups, if that's sort of your goal, if you're sort of on that prevention. If you have people with sort of mild problems, you're looking at maybe three to five sessions, moderate to severe. On average, our studies show that most people are treated very effectively within eight one hour sessions. Now, sessions also can be longer or shorter, but in general, they tend to be around one hour and show effectiveness at only eight sessions. Now, if you compare that to current psychosocial treatments used or sort of other types of programs for violence, it's actually shorter than most. So again, a lot of times folks see something like CETA, they think, oh my goodness, it's complicated, it's got all these elements, must take forever. It actually doesn't take that long to train. Um, and again, you're talking about eight hours, that's it, for us to see massive change in very severe um, kids. And again, all those studies I showed you shows that compared to treatment as usual, and some of these were in people were in group programs that lasted six months to a year, still much more effective. So what are the number of clients people can see? It depends on the hours they have. And actually for us, the biggest variable sometimes is travel time. So for some of you, you might be out in a village that's pretty remote, it takes you two hours to get there, and then maybe between clients or between people, there's another 45 minutes. We've been in rural Congo, for example. That really limits how many people you can see a day. Um, so I just tried to give you some estimates here. Um, okay. Just reading through some questions. So um, I'm, I know I'm at 45 minutes. I've been tracking myself. So Steve and Jennifer, I'm wrapping up. These are my last three slides. And then I will turn it over to Steven and Jennifer to sort of um, work through some of these Q and A's and how we want to run the end. So hang on everyone, just a few more slides. 
we thought it might be helpful to look a little bit at what is an example of CETA at the prevention stage. So again, I stole that picture from Jennifer's slide um, that she talked us through in the beginning about sort of how they see PrEP and, and PEP, and um, this is specifically about violence. So for example, at the prevention stage, CETA could be used with those HIV positive or those even at risk, so they don't have to be HIV positive, they don't even have to have been tested. And if you reduce risk factors like violence, mental health, substance use, and risky behavior, you are preventing HIV. It's pretty clear in the literature that these are such big risk factors for HIV that if you just take a general population and kick violence, mental health, substance use, and risky behavior, you will drop um, you know, the, the HIV rate. Another use, you could use one or two elements, for example, with CETA staff. So um, Jennifer has been spending a lot of time with me and, and really um, helping me understand some of, the, some of the latest work. And I know that some of your folks are having to go find people to be tested, and then once someone's positive, you have to ask them, well, who have you been with? And then, then we have to go find those specific people and, and, and work with them. That's very stressful. And I, and I know that there's a lot of pressure around that right now. So what ends up happening is we see staff that are burnt out, that aren't doing their job well, um, because they have a really stressful job. So how do we work with them? We pull in one or two elements. So we do these one or two elements with CEOs. We do it with leaders and organizations. We're working with NGOs in the field, their organizational staff all the time. So these one or two elements, these are life skills. So they're not only for someone, you know, with, a moderate to severe mental health disorder. Okay, just a couple examples of CETA maybe at the testing stage. And again, this is pulled from Jennifer's um, slide. So same thing, you could use it to um, you know, reduce those risk factors of mental health, substance use, violence. You could also change thoughts, do some triangles and problem solve to increase disclosure. So we've had a number of people that have um, learned how to disclose to their partners, parents that have learned to disclose to their kids or their, or their um, significant others through um, changing thoughts and problem solving. And then again, you see here, you can always work with staff um, or your organization to deal with stress, to deal with buy-in. And then finally, example of um, CETA at the care and treatment stage. So again, certainly our biggest impact we see at this stage is um, reducing violence, mental health, substance use to increase adherence. Um, and so that's, we try to decrease all the mental health, but we also really work in behavior change and problem solving around adherence. Um, we also find that um, here we work a lot with staff to, to help engage clients better um, and increase more buy-in into what we're doing and, and how can we promote adherence from um, an organizational or clinic staff. Okay, so I'm going to stop there. I know there's a few questions I haven't gotten to, but um, just momentarily, I'm going to turn it over to you, Stephen and, and Jennifer, just if you want to um, wrap up or, or how you want to address the sort of next stage of Q&A. Thanks, Laura. Um, thank you so much for that uh, great presentation. Um, the, the detail and the information is just fascinating. Um, I have a couple of questions that I'm going to take the prerogative as uh, moderator <laughs> to ask, um, which are actually more around kind of the practical implementation of this um, going forward. So if, if we are, if you are a CDC country office or PEPFAR country office and you want to incorporate this into your COP, um, how much um, resources, how much dollars are we thinking that we want to um, set aside and, and include in their COP budget? And similarly, if you're an implementing partner and you want to incorporate this into your uh, program, um, and, you know, how much money are we thinking about? Um, so that's kind of one, and it's probably linked to my next question, which is, is there a critical mass in terms of the number of lay providers or, uh, that are trained to do this where you actually see um, see the impact um, that you described? 
That is a fan. Those are great questions. So um, the resources is such a common question for us. Um, and I'll tell you, it's one of the most difficult to answer because what we find is um, costs across countries are very different. Um, what we also find is that costs are largely dependent on how you pay your providers, how much your transport is, things like that. Um, if a program has interest, usually our first suggestion is reach out because we can hear what country you're from and we can give you examples. So we've worked in almost every area of the globe, Southeast Asia, um, Europe, Africa, um, Middle East. And so wherever folks are, we can sort of give you our best guess example. The other thing we typically do is we give, we're, we have um, budgets with line items, not populated, but it gives folks a sense of, okay, I actually need to budget for this and I need to budget for that. So it also greatly depends on how big your program is, which I think leads into your second question, Stephen, about the number of lead providers. I think if you're gonna invest in a training, it's not very cost effective to only train three to five people. Um, and the reason for that is one of the things we find is that um, providers sometimes leave, they go away, they get a better job, they have children, someone might get sick. And so if you train three to five, what we find is those programs often fail because if you lose a couple people, there's, it's really dwindling down. One of the things we try to do within any area is sort of say, who can we combine with or, um, you know, so maybe different organizations or pairing with a faith-based, um, you know, church in the area or something to add to that training. And then there's a cost sharing of having that training. Um, and then the number of, of, you know, people trained, you know, we have seen big impacts when we do a study with training 20 or 30 lay providers. Um, so it's not like you have to train a massive, massive number. The other thing that really varies, Stephen, with your question is how much time lay providers have. So we've worked in some areas where we've trained, for example, 60 lay providers, but they each only have one and a half days to give. So your impact's gonna be less because they simply don't have you know, the, the time, the time to give. Whereas in other places we've trained, you know, 12, but they all work full time. So I think all of these half, you know, these variables um, are beautiful in the sense that CETA is so flexible. We don't, we try never to come in with, this is the cost, this is how it has to be done, this is how many providers you need, because we really want it to be able to fit and be malleable into any type of program, whatever works best for you. Now, I know there's also an annoying side to that is that everyone needs answers. And the answers do come quite quickly once you start talking to us. It's hard to give a general answer. Okay, great, thank you. Um, there's one question that I thought of that, that's interesting that I thought I would um, put out for you, Laura, which is, um, were there any challenges, or what are the challenges observed um, in working with lay counters, lay, lay providers? So um, I think you've just described kind of the, the best case, you know, the outcome, the strong outcomes, but implementing this, there must have been some challenges. Um, uh, there was one question about, well, what are some of the challenges that were observed as you were uh, training for lay, counsel lay counselors or lay providers and then having providers implement the program? Of their approach? Yes, it's a great question. So um, I would say that we run into challenges that you all run into every day. <laughs> um, so I would say that um, they're, they're manageable problems. So for example, um, we've run into, like I just said, a turnover in staff or loss in staff. Um, and so we really have amped up our um, recruitment of providers. What do we look at and really trying to make sure we find people that are going to stay, that are invested, because that actually has been sort of one of the biggest challenges, particularly when they have a skill like CETA. Um, they're sniped up very quickly. Um, so that's been one of our challenges. 
Um, I think our challenge, so we've never had in our work or people we've worked with any problem with recruitment, um, meaning we're able to find a plethora of people with problems. I do, we have consulted with groups though that do have trouble with that. Um, I think those have been easily solvable, um, but that is something to sort of watch out for, that that can be a challenge of sort of how do you actually assess for um, substance use or violence or whatever and make sure people sort of know that this service is, you know, is out there. Um, I'm trying to think what other challenges aren't really something that you deal with every day. We deal with logistical challenges, of course, all the time. So I'm trying not to mention those, but um, cars breaking down, transport, no mobile, load shedding, you know, <laughs> um, things like that. Um, yeah, we've, you know, we, to be honest, we, I think it's because we have such great partners on the ground. We, we always, it's not, it's not our doing, but we have people that have already solved a lot of these challenges. Yeah. Okay, good. Um, just a reminder to folks to keep the questions coming. Uh, there's another question around um, youth providing, serving as peer educators or as lay counselors, and or are uh, the, the lay providers adults or maybe, yeah. uh, young, young adults? So it's, I guess it's peer to peer, the opportunity for peer to peer um, serving as lay counselors. Yeah. So in general, if you were going to integrate, let's call it full CETA into your program, meaning sort of a treatment approach for problems like trauma, substance use, violence, we would not use adolescents or youth. Um, and that's for what I imagine is understandable reasons. We, we don't think it's their role as a youth to try to manage violence or you know, substance use and things like that. Where we have seen youth um, excel is really about um, doing those one element. So let's say for an example, a youth has been through CETA and they really, really loved those triangles and it made a big difference in their life. That's an area where we have found youth, you know, going out, talking about it, um, walking through it. Usually one of our people are sort of there but they talk about it and sort of work through it and, um, and use it. I think they're also fairly good at problem solving. What we wouldn't want them doing is like processing a trauma or feeling responsible for managing substance use, which, which can be dangerous, et cetera. So we're sort of protective of youth is what I would say, um, so that they're not put in a situation that really should be addressed by, by adults. Um, I also see right below that the question of sort of has CETA been used in non face-to-face -face settings? Uh, what an interesting question. <laughs> so um, we actually have a number of trials going on right now with, um, we have a bone CETA trial going on with Syrian refugees. Um, so we're trialing sort of the comparison between face-to-face -face and phone. Um, so far, I will report it's, it's working fine. It's the safety factor that's challenging um, in that, you know, if someone's suicidal or really sort of in a bad place, that's when you, that's when providers become very nervous with that sort of non-face-to-face -face ability. Um, we're also evaluating a web-based application. Um, we get the... We get this question a lot about technology. I have to say that in other studies in global mental health, what we are finding is that although technology is everywhere, it's not, um, it's not at a level of consistency where clients feel very supported by it. So in other words, there's a lot of times where there's no electricity or things are shut down or someone lost their phone things like that where it, it actually clients are not loving it either. Um, so lots, I think lots of new directions um, in that way. I also see a question about um, CETA as an additional package of service to be added to our current HIV peer educator task. 
Um, I'm going to start answering that, and then I'd invite you, Stephen, and, and Jennifer to add on if you want. We've actually done this quite a bit, working with HIV peer educators. What we find with them is they know the communities, they're really invested, they already have all the HIV literature and sort of understanding, um, you know, particularly if they're, if they're a good, good peer educator. Um, and so we have trained them in CETA, and what they learn is they learn to go out and they continue their sort of what you might call their normal peer educator skills with a proportion of their people um, of their families that they see, and then they learn to identify those families that really do need CETA. And because they're already trusted and have a relationship, it's very easy engagement. And so that's why I'm saying they would maybe spend one or two days a week pulling from their community of where they already do a lot of um, peer education and provide CETA to, to those in, in need. So that's worked very well. Stephen and Jennifer, I don't know if you have any additional things thinking about that HIV peer educator role. Uh, this is Stephen. Um, actually, uh, Jennifer, I may actually hunt a question to you that's linked, which is around, um, you know, more and more uh, PEPFAR uh, is moving towards, you know, taking interventions to scale. And so I don't know where this intervention would fall in Kind of that, that that category of pilot to evidence to then something that's t that you know, could be taken to scale. So I, I don't know. Maybe um, you know if you could put on your kind of your CDC program officer hat. Um, you know where 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 could this fall in terms of the ability to then incorporate this as a part of the package of care and services that's delivered? Is it within kind of a pilot? Is it within uh, opportunities? That's a great question, and um, this is something we've been thinking a lot about and why we're so interested in this intervention. I mean, this really is an evidence-based intervention, and so um, we have thought about how could we integrate this into our DREAMS program, possibly. Um, you know, if we have mentors who are adults, um, who are over 18, could, could they potentially be trained in this, in this approach, um, really building the capacity of those DREAMS mentors to really um, take on a little bit extra uh, support for those um, adolescent girls and young women that they work with. We've also discussed integrating this into our OVC program. Um, how can we build this into um, to that to the support that we give to those orphans and vulnerable children and their families? And would this be something that could be integrated into, the, into their care package um, that is already provided? Um, and then also looking at how we could integrate this into care and treatment and working with those who are already positive um, and working with the, the the, re the retention counselors that they work with and, and adding this into a component of what they already do. Um, I think if we, if this was adopted into a country, it would be adopted as an intervention. Um, you know, it's evidence-based, so we could really integrate it into a program. I think we would definitely start at a smaller scale to see how it would work and then expand as appropriate. But I think there are a lot of opportunities for integrating this into, into our PEPFAR programming. Um, I also wanted to make sure that um, Michelle had a question on faith-based communities because that is another area that um, is really of interest to PEPFAR and is expanding. And so I think it'd be great to hear from you, Laura, about um, just your work with faith-based communities. Michelle asked if you could give um, an example of just a practical example of how you would envision um, CETA as part of some of the work that the faith-based communities do. Yeah. Thanks, Jennifer, for all that discussion about sustainability and sort of scale up. That's great. Um, so, Michelle, wonderful question. Uh, again, the flexibility of CETA has um, really taken place within all of our work with faith-based communities. Um, for us, we sort of start the discussion with what are they currently doing and um, sort of where do they where do they see the need. Um, we have worked within faith-based communities on a number of, of things. So for example, we have still used with their staff, including their leadership team, expat, um, local staff, et cetera, some of these elements, um, again, not because there's major problems, but just because there's life stress and they're dealing with tough programs and 
talking about disclosures or talking about traumas or hearing about those all day, that's really, really hard. And so to prevent burnout, to um, sort of promote, we've seen a lot of faith-based communities very invested in sort of trying to help their, their staff still sort of be okay. Um, we have actually trained a lot of um, faith-based leaders, so priests or sort of other folks that sort of are, are leaders of the local community or work closely with, um, for example, like an archdiocese in one area, where we've actually trained those leaders to do some of these skills and because it's much more powerful i think sometimes when it when it comes from from that place and then absolutely as your question says um we also sort of roll out the full CETA. so these faith-based organizations also um, have been a place where people just come and ask for help or they're running programs where they can also learn how to sort of better assess and triage those folks that need you know, CETA for things like trauma symptoms, depression, substance use, things like that. Um, so we've used it in all sorts of, of ways. I don't know if that Thanks answers your question, Michelle, so feel yeah. free to yeah. type in that again. Good. Actually, um, Jennifer, this one may be for you, and this is from uh, Viva. In terms of, um, I would, she, her questions are around OBC programs, but since you also mentioned dreams, so if CDC or PEPFAR teams are wanting to incorporate uh, this into either their OBC or DREAMS programs, well, who would they contact to get kind of the TA to, to move this forward? Would that be you or would that be Laura or both? Yeah, definitely. Um, Viva, I think if you have an OBC program that's interested, it would be great. You and I can talk and then we can make connections with Laura and just um, loop in everyone who needs to be um, included in that conversation. But um, yeah, that would be great if the OBC program were thinking about it, and we could definitely um, facilitate that conversation with Laura and then let it move on from there. So that would be great. Thanks. Great. Um, I'm gonna I'm scrolling through to see if there are any like, like really burning questions that we haven't gotten to. Um, There's one from uh, Regina, which is around the instruments and how are the instruments evaluate different mental problems um, adopted or adapted to different contexts? Yeah, so that's a great question, Regina. Um, so in our work, we actually, as part of our process, start with qualitative work everywhere we go. And then we actually validate instruments before we move to any of these trials. <laughs> so um, not everyone has the luxury to do that. We, we have to write a lot of grants to be able to do that. But um, one of the things we're excited about is we've gotten pretty good at doing um, an analysis called item response theory, which is through the statistical analysis where we can use a more practical, it's really a one page assessment. In most cultures, it's somewhere between 10 and 15 items. And it's built for transdiagnostic models like CETA, meaning a model that addresses a number of different problems. So it's not an instrument just to look at depression or just to look at trauma. And so similar to the treatments, um, for example, IPT is really focused on treating depression, right? And so lots of times in trials and studies, the measure that they use looks only at depression. So we've had to change that. So when you have an approach like CETA, we really need to measure everything. We need to measure that whole comorbidity ball. Um, and so we've gotten, um, we've had some experience now of sort of in different regions coming up with a pretty good instrument that looks enough at all different areas of those common mental disorders um, that are items that tend to cross over and be validated within that culture. So Regina, if you also want to side email me, there's been actually a number of studies in the past five years that sort of look at all the global data on all the global measurement of depression, for example, and they run all these um, statistical analyses to sort of come up with items. So I won't get further into it, but lots of good work on that. I think the take home message for all of you though is that Assessment is important because I think in any program, you're going to want to find a way to cost effectively deliver CETA to those that need it, 
but not to those that don't. Um, or for example, do, you know, more prevention or sort of one session type things for larger groups and then triage those with need to CETA. And so I do think that, you know, thinking about assessment, a very short practical measure is very helpful for your staff to incorporate to help them. Because I think it's, it's hard to judge just from chatting with someone. I don't know if that helped at all or yeah. Stephen, Jennifer, extra yeah. to add. No, that's great. Thanks. Um, thanks, Laura. And there's actually one question from Karen. I think Karen may actually have had to drop off. Um, uh, she had another meeting. But it's one um, that I think is worth responding to and, and, um, so that she's able to hear the response. And it's, is there an element in the training that addresses the counter-transference issues that would be likely to arise within the lay counselors? Great question, Kara. Um, so there is, we deal with that a lot. And I think what you're hitting on is exactly um, one of the issues that we find a lot in that these workers have tough jobs. And even without CETA, um, what they tell us is even as, for example, HIV peer educators, they're hearing about trauma when they go out there. <laughs> they're hearing about rape stories and they're hearing about suicide without the skills to, to hear about it or manage it. And so I would say a couple of things in response to that. One, we have heard from providers globally that we've worked with, and we've probably trained, you know, close to 500 or more, that those issues dissipate once they're trained in CETA because they have the skills to manage it. They know how to handle it. They know what's coming. They know how to work with it. Um, so, so that's one positive. Um, the second is that this is where supervision comes in and why it's really critical that that these lay providers have someone who's been trained in supervision by us and they're a lay provider too. Supervisors do not need to be professionals. They're lay providers like like the counselors, um, but they have someone to go to bring up issues that still might be coming up within certain cases. So I think we've gotten through most of the questions, um, Laura and Jennifer. Are there any uh, folks, the folks remaining on the phone, are there any additional questions um, in the lab? We have about a couple more minutes remaining. Um, if not, um, thank you. Thanks. First of all, thank you, Laura, and thank you, Jennifer, for your presentation and for your willingness to, to do the presentation and share your knowledge and experience with the global community. Um, and then thank you um, to our donors and funders. Laura, you had a fantastic slide that listed everyone. And just from our standpoint, I just want to thank CDC for uh, their support. It's Project Delta and our, our partner, uh, No Means No, um, uh, as well. And uh, look forward to moving, moving the agenda of um, uh, addressing uh, substance abuse, alcohol, psychosocial challenges, um, uh, along with HIV, so that we can have patients and individuals who are being tested, who are being linked to care and treatment, and then who are effectively remaining on care and treatment so that they can benefit from care and treatment through uh, suppress fire loads and decrease morbidity, decrease mortality. So thank you to everyone who stayed through the full hour and a half. You are full, your troopers, and we look forward to the next webinar. Thanks, everyone. Yes, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.